So my uh, morning view one. My talk is more focused via than the previous one. Uh, it is more or less dedicated to a problem of detecting multiple change points uh, arising in a time series. And the main uh, um, aspect of this work is uh, to introduce uh, positive semi-definite kernels in this machinery uh, to be able to detect uh, particular changes. And uh, we'll talk about that in a few seconds. So it is a, a joint work with uh, Sylvain Arlot, Zaid Arshawi, Guillaume Rigay, and uh, Guillemette Marou. Okay. So let's have a look at uh, uh, the outline of the talk. So uh, first, I will introduce some um, motivating examples and uh, also the framework we'll use in the uh, sequel, uh, in particular uh, kernels we'll use. Then uh, I will give details about the algorithm uh, for uh, detecting change points, uh, which is called KCP, and also uh, discuss some uh, computational aspects uh, about this algorithm. And then uh, we'll discuss uh, the mo mainly the statistical part of this talk, uh, which is uh, uh, divided into two parts. The first one is rather concerned with the problem of uh, uh, given, uh, uh, assuming that the, the number of uh, segments is known, uh, where are the change points? And uh, in a second time, uh, how many uh, such change points do you want to detect? Okay, so. Uh, let us start by with uh, 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 the simplest problem, which is uh, detecting changes in the mean of a signal. So you observe a blue curve, and uh, uh, in this example, the blue curve is, uh, has been generated uh, thanks to the regression function, which is in black here, and uh, it is a piecewise constant. And then the, the problem is that uh, you observe abrupt changes uh, in the blue curve, and the main question is to know whether these changes are related to an abrupt change in the regression function or not. And so uh, here it's the case. Some of them are per perhaps difficult to localize and uh, others are f clearly false positives. So how to do this um, in an automatic way? So uh, what are the purpose of this work? The first one is to be able to detect changes in the distributions in the whole distribution of the observations. So in particular, not only in the mean, as I uh, just uh, presented. And for instance, uh, you have many signals. Here it is a, a signal uh, coming from biology. I will not give too much details about that. But anyway, uh, the, fa the fact you can observe is that uh, if you uh, compute a local average of this signal, you will all uh, everywhere obtain something which is equal to one half over mean. And so uh, all the classical techniques which are able to detect changes in the mean of a, si of a signal are completely useless with such uh, structures, uh, structured uh, signal. So uh, the second point is that we'd like to, to be able to detect, uh, to deal with uh, complex data. And so uh, uh, I split them into two different kinds of data, high dimensional ones, uh, which are uh, high dimensional measures or curves, and uh, more structural objects, such as uh, video sequences, uh, graphs, or DNA sequences. Now, for instance, we'd like to be able to, uh, to, uh, to detect uh, 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 video sequences in which a given action is uh, 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 happening. For instance, uh, uh, someone is playing music, or uh, uh, people uh, are applauding, or uh, someone is uh, they are discussing here, for instance. And so the main fact here is that with such an object, for instance, uh, uh, usually, usu usually people uh, summarize observations or images uh, by use of histograms. So you, at each instant, you observe an histogram and you have to, to detect changes from this uh, uh, histogram, uh, time series of histograms. Okay. And uh, another uh, uh, structured object we would like to be able to deal with is, for instance, a time series of graphs. So Obviously, uh, from time to time, the graph changes, but the question is to know whether this change arises by round at random or if it's uh, uh, related to a structural change in the distribution that has generated the graph. So uh, we'd like to be able to detect abrupt changes in such time series of graphs, for instance. Okay. 
And of course, we'd like to be able even uh, ideally to, uh, to, to deal with simu simultaneously deal with uh, such different types of, com of data and uh, provide efficient algorithms as usual. Okay, so how to do that? I first introduce uh, the framework based on kernels. So uh, I assume uh, in uh, all what follows that uh, I observe uh, uh, independent and identical observations, uh, random variables, I mean, uh, x1, xn in a given set, capital X. And uh, this set in particular has no um, particular structure. The only requirement I make I on it is that uh, I can define uh, a, a positive semi-definite kernel K, which is a reproducing kernel in the meaning of, uh, introdu of um, kernels introduced by Aaron, Aaron Zah in 1950. And so uh, as long as you have a, a, a such a kernel, you can have the, the associated uh, reproducing kernel in blood space and uh, uh, also the, can the canonical feature map phi uh, defined this way. And the, uh, idea is simply to use this canonical feature map to be able to map the uh, uh, observation in the initial space uh, to the RKHS uh, where there is a, a vector structure and uh, you can exploit this structure. So it's a versatile tool and a convenient tool to deal with very uh, different kinds of data and our goal is to provide a, a, a unified analysis to deal with uh, very different types of data by use of kernels. Okay, so instances uh, which are very classical, uh, in particular in machine learning. Uh, uh, donc, uh, uh, the, the first one is the Gaussian kernel, which is this defined this way. And the second one, which is perhaps less classical, is called the chi-square kernel, and it is defined as the expectation of minus the uh, chi-square distance between uh, histograms uh, with i bins. Okay, we will use it uh, uh, a little bit later in the, in the talk. So, what is the reason w for introducing the kernels? Uh, it is uh, summarized by uh, this writing. So, uh, you, you have this observation, xi, and thanks to the canonical feature map phi, you can write it uh, as uh, yi. So now, we, you work with uh, yi's, which are uh, iid, and uh, uh, you can write that uh, yi in the Hilbert space is simply equal to its expectation in the RKHS plus uh, an error term, which is defined as uh, simply as a difference by construction. So, uh, why doing that? Because uh, mu i star, we have to be cautious uh, about that because it's uh, defined as the expectation of uh, an object which, is, uh, which belongs to an infinite dim dimensional vector space. Uh, so uh, we have to take care of, of how to define this expectation. And so the mean element, mu i star, is, uh, of, x of pxi is defined as a unique element in the uh, RKHS, such that for every f in the RKHS, mu the, the dot product, the inner product in the RKHS between mu i star and f is equal to the expectation of the canonical feature map at point x i uh, uh, and f. Okay, so the assumptions for having that is that uh, uh, h has to be uh, separable and also that the uh, expectation of k of xx has to be finite. And the, the main point which uh, is in of interest for us is that uh, for character characteristic kernels, for instance, we have that a differ any difference between the distribution pxi and pxj uh, implies a difference between the mean elements. So. Uh, now, uh, since we are interested by detecting changes in the distribution, we have re it, it reduces to detecting changes in the, mean element, in, the, in the mean element along the time. So, uh, that's the reason why we will uh, try to estimate the mean element, the sequence of, of mean elements, which is assumed to be piecewise constant. And, uh, the main point is that uh, we have to, to, take, uh, to keep in mind that uh, uh, in regions where uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is too low, it will be impossible to recover all the true change points because, uh, because of the noise, of course. And so that's the reason why we only try to uh, estimate the, mean, the sequence of mean elements. And of course, in settings where the signal-to-noise ratio is large enough, 
then we, it will provide us with uh, two change points. Okay, so now let us give some details about the algorithm we use. So uh, for a given segmentation tau uh, in uh, D segments, uh, uh, we will use uh, as a quality measure to, uh, to quantify the quality of a given segmentation tau, uh, the same measure of quality as uh, that one used in Arshawi and Kape in 2007, which is uh, denoted by Rn of hat, of t, of tau, sorry, which has a following uh, expression. And uh, the, the thing you have to uh, uh, keep in mind about this quantity is that uh, when we consider the linear kernel, uh, which is simply the dot product between uh, vectors in Rd, then uh, this quantity reduces to the classical least square empirical risk uh, be, uh, of the empirical minimizer. Okay, so uh, we can measure the quality of a, a given segmentation tau thanks to this quantity. And then we'll use uh, the KCP algorithm which is defined this way. So as an input, you have the observations xi, xn, and the kernel to compare them and measure their similarity. As step one, for each, for each number of segment d between one and a given d max, you have to compute the minimum over all the uh, seg possible segmentations with d segments of the, uh, uh, the criterion I just introduced before, so rn hat of tau. So uh, uh, we have to notice that this quantity, this optimization problem is a very hard optimization problem and it is performed by use of dynamic programming. So that uh, for each D, we uh, are given with the best segmentation with D segments. So we will discuss this uh, just after. And the second step of, step of the algorithm is given such a collection of uh, best segmentation for each dimension d between 1 and d max, we have to design a penalized criteria, a criterion, uh, which is defined as the sum of the uh, rn hat of tau of uh, d, plus a penalty term that has to be, uh, uh, that has to be made more precise, and uh, it's precisely uh, what we'll do by use of model selection. So, Finally, by optimizing this penalized criterion, we'll uh, be given with the best uh, number of segments, and then the two, uh, we, will give, we will be given the best segmentation with d hat segments. Okay, so let's have a look to, let's us focus uh, uh, on the first step of the algorithm. So it is based on dynamic programming. The update rule of the dynamic programming algorithm is the following one. So it says that for each number of segments between 2 and d max, the cost of a best segmentation in d segments uh, from 1 to n is equal to the minimum of the cost of a best segmentation in d minus 1 segments up to d, up to time t, plus the cost of only one segment between t and n. So, um, from that, the usual strategy, so, okay, uh, the cost of a segment be uh, between t and n uh, has the following formula. And the usual strategy is uh, first to compute this, the cost matrix, which is of size n times n, and, uh, and, uh, and store it. And so it, induce, it, in, it induces um, a space complexity of n square, because you have to store this n square matrix. And also, uh, once this uh, uh, strategy, which is quite naive, uh, is embedded in the kernel uh, framework, it uh, costs in time n, n to the 4, because you have to compute n square terms, C, S, T, and each of them uh, relies or involves a quadratic number of, of terms, uh, which are coefficients of a gram matrix. So it's by far too costly to be able to deal with uh, large signals. So with uh, Guillaume Rigay and Guimet Marot, we have proposed a, a small change in this uh, algorithm, which is summarized by uh, this pseudocode, which uh, is only based on two ideas. The first one is that uh, we never have to, to store the cost matrix because uh, we do not want to have a, a space complexity uh, as of uh, n square. And uh, uh, having look, a look to uh, uh, 
to the, the algorithm, we see that the, the main, the, 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 the most influential uh, uh, step is to be able to update, uh, to compute uh, the t plus one column of the cost matrix from the, uh, the column ct. So uh, to have an update rule uh, to compute this, uh, this uh, column from this one, from the previous one. And uh, it, al it allows us to avoid uh, storing uh, the whole cost matrix, but uh, uh, and so to reduce the space complexity to uh, line to be linear in n, and the time complexity to be n square at most. So it is illustrated uh, in this picture when you see the quartic uh, uh, complex time complexity of a naive implementation and uh, the reduced time complexity of our improvement. And also, as you can notice, uh, we are able to uh, deal with uh, sample size of uh, 100,000 uh, uh, observations in uh, about uh, uh, three minutes. So it's already quite interesting to do things, but uh, anyway, it can be seen as a, a limitation uh, because uh, it, pro it prevents us from uh, uh, dealing with very, very large uh, sample sizes. And so an open question, which would be interested to to uh, to uh, um, sec uh, to um, address would be to be able to uh, reduce this computation time, uh, for instance, by use of rank matrix approximation. Uh, we could use uh, a rank matrix approximation of uh, to the the gram matrix and use it with uh, use this with uh, some uh, um, uh, pruning strategies. Uh, which are uh, used uh, actually uh, uh, to uh, reduce the computation time of uh, uh, dynamic programming algorithm. And also an another point is to be able to quantify what has been lost by this approximation. <coughs> okay. So, so the modification to the algorithm that Sorry. we presented was an approximation? No, the uh, algorithm I just presented is uh, provides you uh, an exact solution okay. to a problem. But uh, uh, to, uh, a way to uh, be able to reduce this computation time would be to, to uh, use an approximation of the original gram matrix um, and perform a pruned version of this algorithm. And uh, the, the fact is that you have to, uh, to be able to quantify what has been lost from a statistical po point of view uh, by using this approximation. Okay. So now... Uh, let us uh, uh, talk about the, the st statistical performance of uh, the step one of the algorithm. I mean, for each time, uh, number of segment D, we are, we, we, I say that uh, we are able, using dynamic programming, to uh, compute the best segmentation with D segments by minimizing this criterion. Okay, so what is the statistical performance of this quantity of this uh, procedure? Uh, to compare uh, the quality of segmentations, we introduce two uh, distances between segmentations. The first one is quite classical, it is the host of distance. And the second, uh, second one is the Frobenius distance. It is defined as the Frobenius norm between matrices. And uh, matri the matrix uh, M tau is simply uh, defined this way. So M tau ij, so the coefficient I ij of this matrix, is simply is equal to uh, 1 if i, j belong to the same segment of segmentation tau, divided by the cardinality of this segment. Okay, so, so um, with these uh, distances between uh, segmentation, we consider several scenarios uh, to assess, from an empirical point of view, the quality of this first step uh, uh, when we uh, v vary the, the choice of a kernel we use. So, the first scenario uh, it is uh, so here in this picture you you see an instance of the kind of signal we have to deal with so first we choose we define uh, a true segmentation in d star which is equal to uh, 11 segments uh, so here you have uh, in red uh, da a dashed line uh, the position of the two breakpoints break so given such a, a true partition in each segment we randomly choose a distribution among a pool of seven of them, and uh, all these segmentation, all these distributions share the say the a different have a different mean and variance. So, as long as, as soon as you change uh, from this segment to the other, the following one, uh, you have uh, a change in the mean and in the variance. 
So it's quite a, already a, a, a simple problem. And uh, here are the results. So uh, on the left panel, you see the performance uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Hausdorff distance and the Frobenius norm for the Gaussian kernel. Uh, so uh, here the curves are plotted versus the, the number of segments. And uh, so what, we, what we see is that uh, the Gaussian kernel performs quite well because the minimum location, so the best performance uh, of the segmentation uh, is obtained with uh, uh, the dimension which is equal to the, the true one, so this star is equal to uh, 11. And uh, if we compare this performance uh, to what is obtained by use of a linear kernel, uh, you see that, uh, for instance, uh, if you look at the Hausdorff distance, you see that it is uh, always decreasing. And uh, what it means, and in particular even for large dimensions, and so what it means, it means that even when the dimension, so the, the number of segments uh, is by far larger than the true one, you, are, uh, you still are to uh, add segment, uh, change points which are uh, improving, so which are close to true ones and better from the previous ones. So generally speaking, it means that the, the linear kernel puts ch changes in the noise simply. And it is confirmed by the, uh, these uh, graphs. So here it is the uh, frequencies of exact recovery of each position as a true change point. And what you see, the, the, the true change points are in red, and you see uh, the results for the Gaussian kernel and for the linear one. And you observe that uh, over uh, 500 repetitions, uh, we uh, detect exactly the true change points in at least 60% of the re uh, repetitions. Why, uh, whereas with a linear kernel, it is the, the exact recovery frequency is between 10 and 20% only. Okay, if I turn to the second scenario, uh, the main difference between the second scenario and the previous one is that here, uh, when you change from a segment to the following one, the next one, uh, Actually, you change. Uh, you, there is no change in mean and in variance. So uh, the distribution here and here share the same mean and variance. So the difference occurs at a higher order of the in the distributions of the observations. <coughs> okay. So here you have an instance of a kind of signal you have to to be able to to, to deal with. And the results are quite similar. So you have uh, the same minimum location, which is uh, at the true uh, number of segments. And here, uh, the, the conclusion for uh, the linear kernel uh, are similar, but, the, but, but the, the performance is even worse than what it used to. <coughs> okay, and here you see that the uh, exact recovery frequency uh, for the linear kernel is uh, almost null. So you almost never are able to recover a true change point. It only puts change points in noisy regions. Okay, we have also considered another kernel, which is the Hermit one, because uh, uh, it is related to the Hermit polynomials. And uh, the main idea of this uh, kernel is simply that uh, it is sensitive to, the to changes arising in the distribution uh, up to the f uh, in the first uh, five moments of the distributions. So the performance in terms of exact recovery frequency are better than uh, with the linear kernel, of course, but you see that there is still a difference between what is provided by the Gaussian kernel, uh, uh, and uh, it is mostly related to the fact that the Gaussian kernel is a characteristic kernel, which is not the case for the, the Hermit kernel. Okay, and the last scenario, uh, it says that uh, okay at each uh, ta at each uh, position we observe a uh, uh, um, uh, twenty bins histogram. So uh, in each segment we have randomly chosen uh, the twenty coefficients of this Dirichlet process, and uh, so, so such that in uh, in each segment we are able to to generate uh, uh, histograms with twenty bins. Okay. So you have an instance of uh, what you can uh, observe uh, in the first three coordinates of the signal you observe. <coughs> 
And uh, an important question is that uh, uh, in this scenario, uh, we are dealing with a, a structured object because the, the sum of the column of the histogram, or so, uh, the sum is equal to one. Uh, so the question is, uh, um, is it necessary um, to, uh, to, to take into account this uh, structure of uh, the data we are uh, dealing with? And, as, and to answer this question, we have co uh, compared two different uh, kernels. So the chi-square one, I've already introduced uh, a little bit earlier, and the Gaussian kernel, which is here. And uh, the main point is that the Gaussian kernel ignores the structure of the data. So it doesn't know that this is an histogram. It considers that uh, each observation is simply a vector in R20. And what you see is that per the performance of uh, the Gaussian kernel is uh, less accurate than what you uh, obtain with the chi-square, which exploits precisely this structure. And it is confirmed by the uh, exact recovery frequencies, because the you observe that the performance is uh, lower with the Gaussian kernel than with uh, chi-square one. So there is a potential gain in exploiting the structure of the data. Uh, that's the main conclusion for this uh, third scenario. Okay, so now uh, we'll uh, uh, talk about the last part of this talk. And so uh, it is uh, mainly uh, uh, concerned with the problem of designing a penalty uh, so that uh, minimizing this penalized criterion uh, uh, provides you with uh, an estimator of the number of segments. And this is done by model selection. <coughs> So, uh, the model was the following one. So, uh, each observation in the RKHS is equal to its expectation plus uh, a noise term. And uh, we assume that the, the, the sequence of mean elements is piecewise constant. So, for a given segmentation two, uh, we can consider the, ve the associated uh, vector space, which is made of uh, piecewise constant functions uh, uh, built from uh, this segmentation tau. So it is denoted by f tau, and the estimator we consider is simply the, the empirical risk minimizer, uh, which is denoted by mu hat tau, and uh, it is simply for us uh, the orthogonal projection onto uh, this uh, vector space. <coughs> so, uh, what is the best possible choice of penalty to uh, to uh, to find the best segmentation? Uh, actually, it is what we call the, the ideal penalty, and uh, how, it is, how is it defined uh, in this way? So the ideal penalty is what we have to add to the empirical risk to recover the, the best possible uh, segmentation, uh, which is called the oracle segmentation. So first, uh, how would you uh, would, would we uh, re recover the, the best segmentation? Well, if we minimize this quantity, so, which is the, 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 the true loss uh, of, uh, associated with uh, the segmentation tau. Uh, if you minimize this quantity over tau, you, you get the, the best possible uh, segmentation tau star. And so, it's uh, simply a matter of writing this in this way, but uh, you can uh, define the penalty as the difference between uh, this quantity and this one. And writing this in another way, it is equal to a, a sum of a quadratic term and a linear term. So our strategy is the following one. Uh, it's simply to use concentration inequalities to be able to provide an upper bound with high probability of uh, this penal uh, pe uh, ideal penalty. And so uh, we have provided a uh, concentration inequality for the linear term uh, first, which is simply based on Bernstein inequality, so it's quite classical and uh, another concentration inequality for the, uh, the, the quadratic term. And so it is this one. So it is stated under uh, some assumptions. The first one is says simply that we assume that the data are bounded in the RKHS. So it's true uh, as long as, uh, for instance, we consider a bounded kernel, or if uh, we are in settings where uh, Xi's are bounded themselves. And we also assume that the noise uh, in the RKHS is uh, bounded by a constant Vmax. So in particular, we do not assume that uh, uh, data are Gaussian and uh, uh, there is no uh, constant variance assumption. So uh, uh, 
this result allows you, uh, us to, to, to deal with uh, Hilbert valued vectors and not only uh, vectors in RD uh, as, i as it used to uh, with uh, ongoing results uh, of that kind. And so our result says that the quadratic term is, uh, um, is close to ex expectation with a deviation term which is related to the estimation error and uh, another deviation which uh, uh, depends on the next. And an important fact is that uh, this dependency on uh, the x here, which is related to the probability of a large event on which uh, this uh, inequality holds true, uh, uh, has to be uh, simply x and not x squared. Uh, in particular, if you uh, uh, use uh, some strategies based on telegram inequality, for instance, you would get an x square. And uh, in, in our setting where uh, we have uh, large collections of uh, uh, segmentation, uh, this x square uh, uh, prevents you from, uh, from uh, 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 getting an, an accurate result. So it's, it was important to, to derive, uh, to get this order of magnitude for a second deviation. Okay, and so uh, thanks to uh, these uh, concentration inequalities, we are able to derive an oracle inequality, uh, which simply says, uh, under uh, our assumptions, that uh, if we define the best uh, segmentation by minimizing the, this uh, penal uh, penalized criterion, where the penalty is defined this way, so you have constant C1 and C2, uh, d, d tau is simply the number of, of segments of the segmentation tau, then uh, there exists a, an event of high probability on which uh, the performance of the final estimator you get is, uh, remains uh, almost the same as the best performance you can get with an estimator you consider uh, up to a constant which is larger than one and the remainder term. And so <coughs> the, the, the interesting thing is that in our more general setting, because we consider Hilbert valued vectors, we were able to recover a penalty which is quite similar to the one uh, um, uh, obtained by, uh, derived by uh, Birger and Massa in 2001 uh, under a Gaussian assumption, for instance, and uh, real valued vectors. Okay, so the, 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 the whole algorithm says simply uh, can be split into two steps. So the first one is compute by pro dyna dynamic programming the, optim the optimum of this, qu this criterion over all the segmentation with uh, D segments. And in second step, uh, find the best number of segments by optimizing this penali uh, penalized criterion. And uh, another important uh, point is that um, C1 and C2 are constants and they have been uh, um, uh, chosen from data uh, by use of uh, what we call the slope heuristics. Yeah, so yes. I, do you know, if I knew everything about the problem, could I get the function for C1 and C2? Does it depend on the noise or whatever? Or uh, no, it's uh, as far as I know, it's a really difficult thing to get. It's uh, still an open question. But can you get like C1, C2? Like, uh, does, it, does it work if you get C1 and C2 only approximately? Um, actually, uh, from uh, when we derive such a, uh, a result, we get C1 and C2, uh, we get um, probably pessimistic values or f uh, of uh, C1 and C2 from theory because they are derived from uh, concentration inequalities and uh, constant are not optimized for that. Yes. If, if, I were, if I were to be the devil's advocate, is yes. that estimating C1 and C2 as hard as estimating the number of checkpoints? I would not say that because uh, uh, this uh, slope heuristics is based on uh, theoretical arguments uh, which says that uh, in some regimes it is it works quite well to be able to, uh, to, to estimate these uh, uh, constants. So it's not really uh, a difficult problem uh, in practice. So uh, if we compare now uh, the performance uh, of the penalized criterion we optimize, which is the black curve, uh, uh, to the, the true risk, the red curve, you see that uh, in the scenario one, which is the, the, simplest, the simplest one, uh, both for the Gaussian kernel and the Hermit kernel, uh, our penalty uh, 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 captures the, uh, is not that bad to, uh, to, to capture the, the behavior of a true risk. And the minimum location is, uh, is the same. 
and uh, you observe that the, the uh, exact recovery frequencies uh, for all the, change, the true change points uh, when we choose d hat is quite good. And uh, it is even better if we allow uh, a small mistakes. I mean, if you have a, a candidate change point and you uh, uh, consider that it is a true recovery if you allow uh, a small error, uh, for instance, a free position error, uh, then uh, the, the these uh, frequencies uh, grow uh, up to uh, uh, 70%. So it's the same conclusion holds true for the second scenario when the uh, all the distributions have the same mean and same variance. Okay, you see that the distribution of the d hat uh, is a little bit spread, uh, more spread than the previous one, but the, the it is a harder problem, actually. And also uh, dealing with uh, histogram valued uh, data, which was quite, quite well. Okay, so uh, to summarize, we have provided and described um, uh, an algorithm uh, to detect changes arising in the distribution of observations. Uh, we, it is relatively efficient and uh, it, it is theoretically grounded uh, thanks to uh, consumption inequality and uh, also oracle inequality which provides non-asymptotic guarantee on the performance of this algorithm and it allows to uh, deal with uh, vectors and also structured data such as graphs and so on, as long as you can define a kernel on that. And there are uh, many open problems. Some of them are, for instance, uh, the one I've already mentioned about the reducing the n squared time. Uh, of course, you can use approximations of, uh, instead of the dynamic programming algorithm, if you want. But uh, the, the key uh, thing is that you the, the most important thing is to, uh, to uh, always to quantify what has been lost by using this approximation. And it is a really hard problem from a statistical point of view. Um, we have also to investigate, for instance, the link between uh, the choice of a kernel and the type of uh, changes we are uh, uh, sensitive. Uh, uh, so uh, if it, de it depends on the kind of change arising in the first or second moments or uh, uh, in the higher moments of the distribution, uh, perhaps the, the, the given kernel is not the best for all of that uh, simultaneously, even if, if it is characteristic, because uh, in theory, uh, characteristic kernels are sensitive to any cha uh, in a cha uh, to a change arising in any moment of the distribution, but uh, not in the same way if it uh, arises in the first moment or uh, in the higher order moments. Uh, okay. Uh, and the last uh, uh, point is to, uh, th there is, a, there is a, so uh, you mentioned the slope heuristic. Um, I, had to say, I have to say that um, uh, using that induces an additional computational cost because you have to explore uh, uh, segmentations up to d max. And uh, as you see uh, in the commercial complexity, all complexities tie in time and in space are linear in d max. So it's a, an important uh, feature of the problem. So uh, it, is, uh, it would be a good thing to be able to revisit this slope heuristic to save computation resources, uh, both in time and space, and uh, while uh, in the same time preserving an ac accuracy. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments, Wana? Yep. Go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I, have a, I have a doubt. Uh, uh, how you uh, how you estimate how you could you detect your the changement of the uh, variance if two if two ha fragments have the same uh, mean but different uh, uh, variance the kernel estimates will give the same uh, estimate mu star mu 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 uh. no 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 precisely not uh, uh, thanks to uh, this property. Uh, uh, tac, tac, tac. Uh, yes, before, before that. Yes. When you have a, a kernel which is characteristic, then any change between the two distributions induces a change in the mean elements. And so if you, as long as you use a characteristic kernel, uh, uh, 
if you have a change between these two distributions, you can you in print in principle you should be able to detect this change uh, in terms of the uh, mean elements. So the mean elements should not be the same. Otherwise, uh, it contradicts the fact that the canary is characteristics. So the mu mu hat will be different too. Of course, yes. Ah, uh, uh, it depends on. Uh, okay, so uh, in the mu star i is different uh, from the mu j star because the theory says that. But actually, when you estimate uh, things, so this one and this one, uh, obviously it depends on the quality of your estimator you use. And so, uh, if you are in noisy regions, if you have a very, uh, a s a very small number of observations, uh, mu hat, uh, this the estimator of this quantity and this one should be very similar and so similar that you can't detect any change. But it's only a matter of a signal to noise ratio, I would say. Is it clear? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you use the Gaussian kernel. So, how did your result depend on the bandwidth of your Gaussian kernel, and how did you choose the bandwidth? Okay. So, um, of course, it depends on the bandwidth, but um, in a very um, not in uh, uh, okay. How can I say that? Uh, the dependence is not so strong because, uh, except if you choose a very, very, very bad. Uh, uh, bandwidth because it's, uh, for instance, I would say uh, uh, 10 to the minus 4 and uh, uh, or uh, in the other extreme uh, 10 to the power 10, for instance. But except such uh, extreme uh, situations, it would work not that bad. And of course, there is an optimal uh, bandwidth. But uh, all the results I've uh, shown to you uh, are not provided with uh, an optimized bandwidth. We have only considered a bandwidth which provides us with uh, uh, not that bad uh, results. So there is uh, some room for improvement uh, if we were able to, to uh, precisely uh, choose that bandwidth. But w in terms of uh, the analysis, where does the bandwidth come into as an assumption or in terms of the... Uh, I think uh, we do not have uh, any elements to answer because um, uh, if I show you the Oracle inequality, you will say that the norm, uh, which, yes, this norm here, it depends on the kernel. Depe because it is the sum, um, it is defined this way, uh, sorry for that, yes, this way. It is this norm which is the sum over all the positions of the norm of Fi in the Oracle H. H. And uh, this norm depends on the, of the, on the kernel you have chosen. So uh, I, 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 I say that because, uh, um, okay, uh, I'm lost, uh, sorry. Yes, uh, this one. Uh, so uh, the, the, the bandwidth appears here and also here. So it's quite difficult to say that uh, there is a, uh, for instance, you, you, you cannot op optimize uh, in saying that uh, I will uh, choose H such that this upper bound is the uh, smallest as possible because it depends also on this quantity and uh, it's not that true. So uh, we have a partial answer for that one. So the, for the Gaussian kernel, the distance between mean elements is essentially the uh, L2 distance between the kernel density estimates. Okay. And the mm -hmm. width of the density of the, of the kernel is the width of the, of the of pattern windows. So this gives you like an idea of the influence of the, uh, of the width. And this leads to a question. Mm -hmm. like, so here, so as I just said, like different mean elements is like L2 distance between like uh, distributions which is known to be not very good for, for doing tests, for example, mm -hmm. because it's invariant to like, it's not like sensitive to small changes mm -hmm. in distributions. So I will try to normalize the means by the variances to get a better robustness to the like, no. mm -hmm. and Could you, or...? Um, is it uh, an estimated variance, or...? Uh, yes, of course. So the analysis is uh, would be uh, really more difficult, so... Perhaps it's possible, but uh, with uh, many technical additional technicalities, I would say. 
the other paper in the that is that work at uh, Wisconsin trying to do this for tests uh, going from different in elements to like normalize the difference and they are able to, to show stuff that they do work on. Yep. Uh, in your simulations, how do you choose uh, Dmax? Uh, my question is, uh, for, for example, for model selection, uh, there is some kind of threshold. If you choose Dmax, for example, uh, less than the true number of change points you had, uh, you will like do not so badly because you will find the most like re reliable change point detection. And if you choose the parameter of uh, of uh, model selection very big, you can overfit and... Uh... I agree. Uh, actually, uh, I would say, except in uh, very extreme situations, uh, uh, the, the choice of Dmax is really influential in that step. I mean, when, when I will uh, choose uh, from, the date, from data, when I will estimate from data uh, constants C1 and C2 by use of slope heuristics. Uh, the slope heuristics, uh, uh, it's difficult to explain that in a few seconds, but uh, um, uh, it says, roughly speaking, that uh, you can predict the, the type of dependence with respect to the dimension of the curve uh, of the function, which is uh, the empirical risk. Uh, so you can, you can, with high probability, you can uh, say what should be the behavior of the empirical risk as the dimension grows. And, uh, or at least is large enough. And uh, um, uh, use, use with this slope heuristic, you exploit the, the knowledge of this uh, shape of uh, the, the, the empirical risk should have, uh, to, um, uh, and you will learn from this shape, you compare the, this shape to the, the observed uh, uh, shape of the empirical risk. And uh, the comparison provides you with these two constants. And the fact is that uh, this comparison depends on the range of value of d you will uh, use to make this comparison. And if it's too small, you will have really bad estimates of these two quantities and it will degrade your uh, results. So uh, in practice, in our simulations, I've chosen uh, d max equal to 100. And uh, uh, if you rem re remember, uh, d star was equal to uh, 11. So, but uh, it already provides really reliable results with uh, lower values of d max. But uh, it was only a, a, a way to uh, to uh, to be um, uh, no, I uh, no, no. But uh, is it clear? Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, last question for oh. the slide before 39. Okay. Uh, could you get like the delta one to go to one if n a, if n is sufficiently large? So uh, there is a, a, a. I would say it means nothing because uh, there is a log n which is in this penalty, and so uh, uh, you can decrease uh, the delta one, but uh, it will increase the, con the other constant here. So it's a matter of trade-off, and. Uh, and uh, even if delta 1 is equal to 1, it does not say really that the, 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 uh, the procedure is optimal because there is a log n here and it's not very clear. Simon? Uh, do you have results in terms of the, the recovery of tau instead of, because this is not giving recovery of tau, this is giving the... Uh, from from practical point of view, there is the simulation uh, yeah, results. Uh, from a theory, uh, I would say there is the PhD of Damien Garraud, uh, which is uh, co-advised by uh, Gerard Bio and Sylvain Lowe, uh, who uh, is uh, exactly doing that. And so he has uh, consistency results to show that this procedure, the same algorithm, uh, or almost the same, uh, provides consistency for the two hat uh, when estimating two star, the true segmentation. And do you also have a notion of a distance? Com because you, you already mentioned some distance on the segmentation. So yeah, do you have guarantees on the size of the distance? For uh, I would say that I, I'm pretty sure that there is a rate of convergence for uh, uh, Osdorf and uh, probably uh, Frobenius. Yeah, okay. that's true. Yeah, in fact, yes. Damien is there. Oh, okay. Okay, so just there's. And more on the bandwidth of the Gaussian kernel. So I have a result on the 
on the number of change points and it depends on the, the norm in the RKHS. So this norm is like a function of uh, the bandwidth and it's like a, <coughs> a bump. So there is an optimum. Well, under many assumptions. No further questions for uh, Alain? Okay, so let's uh, thank uh, Alain again.